Andrea. Thanks, Leora. Uh, this change management model that you see here, <clears throat> the seven-step model, it uses a, it's a metaphor here for putting the house in order. You'll see the house on the left-hand side as being somewhat uh, disheveled, and on the right-hand side, we're, we're creating a, a, an organization that, that is, is what we expect it to be. So this will be up. We'll have this slide up uh, over much of the, uh, the planning phase, over the next hour or so. But before we do that, before we head back to the planning phase, what I'd like to do is, is pop back to the computers for a second, and I'll show you how to play the game. OK. Great. So what we've been doing is been interviewing. And the interview tab is in the bottom right-hand corner. You'll, you'll notice it down here. This is a, a tactics-based simulation. So it's, it's different from most business games out there, where we have things that we can do. And these things that we can do are organized in four categories, informational, educational, cultural, and organizational. You'll notice the, the, the tabs at the top. So things like an annual CSR report. And for that particular tactic on the right-hand side, there's an audience to whom it relates, a time, five weeks, and a cost of $10,000. Might be pretty cheap. Prepare and circulate an annual CSR report to all stakeholders. Included in the report is an audit of current practice and future initiatives. Now you'll notice on the top right-hand corner are our constraints, our resource constraints. We have three years, 156 weeks, and $400,000. This is for SkyTech. Again, SkyTech is, is a smaller organization. If we go into the other tabs here, we have different tactics, like an orientation video or Head Start funding under cultural an annual CSR dinner, establishing CSR measures. So these are all different things that you can do as you, uh, as you create your, your CSR plan and strategy. Now, in here, there are tactics that are good, and there are certainly some tactics that are bad that you would never want to do. And you'd never want to do it for two reasons. One, it would go against CSR best practice, and the other, it might go against change management best practice. So we always want to create that sense of urgency. We never want to deflate it. There are tactics in here that are appropriate for the early on in the process. Remember, we're in the diagnosis phase of that seven-step model. Think about the tactics that relate to the diagnosis phase and the second step, the third step, et cetera. Now, to help you do that, and this is something that we've never done before, but we know that time is a bit limited here, we'll be providing each team with tactics cards, or tactic cards. So each of the tactics is on a card, and you'll be able to take these tactics, read through them, and prioritize them on your own desks there. So you'll be able to look at them and move them around. All of the tactics are also uh, included within the, uh, the player's guide, too. OK, so how do we play this? So we're looking at a series of tactics, probably 20 to 25 things that we can do. We've built our plan over the next hour. Then we want to implement it. So we select a tactic that we think might be good. And don't take my advice here, but I'm going to replace the offshore manager. So four weeks and $30,000. We could go ahead and implement this tactic. You see down in the bottom right-hand corner, there's an implement button. And as we, if we click implement, we can head back to the conversion map. Now, the conversion map shows the stakeholders that we've interviewed. And the numbers there indicate their buy-in into the change process. So we're trying to create awareness, then, first accept, then, then acceptance, then adoption, and, and then to have them become advocates of the CSR program. And right now, the numbers three, five, seven. That's an index score from 0 to 100. And there's a little tiny meter there above it. Folks have, have barely bought into this. And all of those scores are summarized on the right-hand side in the thermometer, the 5%. So our goal is to select tactics at the right time. As we select the right tactics, we're going to get stakeholder buy-in, getting people to buy into this particular initiative. And you'll see the meters moving forward. Implement a tactic, take a look to see who's moved. And, and then implement your next tactic at that particular stage. Now, our goal is 60%. And it'll take 20, 25 tactics to hit 60%. It's a tough thing to do. Typically, as I said, I hope to get, be great to have 15 teams hit that objective today. I'm sure we'll have all 30. But uh, just to set expectations, it's, it's pretty tough. Okay. A couple of other things I'll show you here. As you select tactics and implement them, they're done. You can't implement that tactic again at a later time. It's finished, regardless of the output, whether people have moved forward or some people may have moved back, it's done. So you can go and take a look in the decision log in the bottom, and it shows a sequential list of all the tactics that, that folks have chosen, or that you have chosen. Now, in addition to this quantitative feedback that you receive in the thermometer, 
and in the index scores, you'll also get qualitative feedback. So various different stakeholders will pop up from time to time, either agreeing or disagreeing with the, the last decision that you made. And that qualitative feedback is stored in coach points. Now the last tab that you haven't seen is the planner, and that's a tool that we won't use today because we have these cards, and it just takes a little bit too much time that, that we have right today. So, now does everybody have, a, have the deck of cards here? No? So we need a couple decks out here. That's great. Perfect. Now, again, all of these tactics on the cards are, are within the simulation. So there's nothing else in the simulation. What I would encourage you from a process point of view, what we typically do is have teams not even look at the computer for the next hour. So it's 9.30 right now. From 9.30 until 10.30, just focus on the cards. Again, the, some of the tactics are in the player's guide. They're the same tactics. You can use that as well. But focus on the cards, looking through the cards, sorting out what your plan is going to be. And then at 10.30, we'll have a, a brief little uh, uh, tea break. And uh, then we'll come back into the room and implement and see how, we, uh, how our, our change plan works. Okay, any questions at this stage? Okay, one final, yes. Yes, that's right. Okay, the question was, are we assuming that each of the stakeholders' uh, value is the same? And, and the answer is yes. So we have a series of stakeholders internally that's going to weight it, certainly internally, but a series of external stakeholders as well. And it's kind of a balance between internal and external stakeholders. But it's a very good point. What you will notice, though, is that some stakeholders will move more quickly than others. And that, in fact, within the organization, within all of the stakeholders, there will be some resistors, there will be some bystanders, there will be some helpers and champions, just like we have in all organizations. So that's a, an additional dynamic that's, that, that you will experience. OK? Now the last, last, last note here is that as you go through your tactics, you'll notice that some of the tactics have a, a little asterisk beside them. And these tactics are what we refer to as execution tactics. So not only do you have to, to pick the right time for that particular tactic, but once you implement it, it will ask you, for example, if you're choosing your project leader, it will ask you, who do you want to be the project leader? OK, so you'll see. Or if you're going to do a stakeholder analysis, it will ask you to actually engage in that stakeholder analysis and do that, the evaluation yourself. So there are a series of tactics with the asterisks, and that's what they are if you have any questions. OK? Again, we'll be circulating around if you have any additional questions. Yeah. OK. Just a, a quick final question here about what the categories mean at the top. And the categories that say informational share, that's where you can find the tactic in the simulation, but it has from an or, it's just an, an organizing tool. It doesn't really indicate when the right time to implement any particular tactic is. Okay, this will this will incent people to to come in. What we have, for those of us who are in the room, is a scoreboard, and we sometimes use competition to. Uh, to heighten the emotional engagement of some of our simulations. And we can downplay it sometimes. But you'll see here that Team 28 has become uh, rather cheeky of them. They've gone ahead. And they're at 25% right now. So we'll have the scoreboard up here for the, uh, the remainder of the implementation phase, um, just for fun. But what you're going through right now is your plan that you've put together, and, and most of you have organized wonderful, wonderful plans with the yellow cards there. Go through, pick your first couple of tactics, or pick your first tactic, and if it's a board governance audit, click on that tactic, and then click the implement button. After you click implement, you may get some qualitative feedback, but you'll certainly get quantitative feedback through this thermometer on the right-hand side and by heading over to the conversion map on the bottom left, showing the various different stakeholders and their buy-in into the change program. OK? All right, good luck. I think, um, I think we had almost every single team here today uh, achieve the objective of 60% for, 
fantastic. A big round of applause for, for everybody here. Congratulations. And again, my expectations are, are realistic in so much that we typically get a 40% you know, success rate. So um, again, coming into here, I would expect everybody to get to 60%. But at the same time, it's a, it's a bit of a, I hope you found it a bit of a challenging and, and, and a fun game as well today. Uh, what, I've, uh, what we'll do, a couple things here. One I thought it would do, start off, uh, team number 19 has, has graciously allowed me to look at their game and, and show the game publicly here. Uh, all the decisions that are made are saved in a back-end database. And what this allows you to do is play it on, a, on an individual basis, but also in a, in a team basis, and get a customized scorecard feedback. I'll, I'll show you that quickly before we move into a more of a formal debrief. So the different components of this website, uh, we were in the experience section. In the explore section, it, it consists of, of theory, much, le, much as Lior went through around what is CSR, why is it important, the business case, et cetera, and implementation using a change methodology. Experience is the simulation. Now the reflect module here, and this is for team number 19, I believe. We'll take a look. The epilogue. Whoops. Okay, so we talked a little bit about what this means, and we're looking at the five pillars here, and the different tactics that were implemented, okay? And when they were implemented. We can go into a, a series of other different dimensions. This particular model, it uh, focuses on leadership, and when we talk about leadership and creating a leadership simulation, we, obviously we start with what is leadership, and the, the the dictionary definition of leadership is a, it's a process where a, a group of, we, we influence and control a group of people, their behaviors towards achieving a common goal. And that's relevant whether it's in, in political circles or whether it's in a, a organizational or, or even in, in Canada we call it local PTA, Parent Teacher Association. It's, it's a, a group of people who are together for a common purpose and we're looking to influence and control them. Change management is all about how do you influence people, how do you motivate people, get them to buy into something. Because we can conceptualize it, understand it intellectually that this is the right thing to do. CSR makes sense to us on, on so many different levels. But to actually implement it into an organization requires a, a process and a disciplined approach. So the approach itself, if we look at the particular tactics, we'll look at from a timing perspective and the evaluative model that sits underneath. Now these are the tactics that team number 19 selected and they look very familiar. I think a lot of the teams uh, followed a similar pattern of decision making. We have these bars here, they kind of look a bit alien. The model that sits underneath is, a, it uses fuzzy logic principles that say there's no right or wrong time to implement a tactic but rather shades of gray. And it allows you to play the simulation 30 different ways and get 30 different outcomes. And as you can see here, some of these tactics here, stakeholder analysis, excellent tactic, optimal stage is diagnosis, but it would also be effective during the second and the third stage as well, just less so. Management consultation, et cetera. And this team did very well. Diagnosis, create vision and strategy, diagnosis. Nobody gets it perfect, and we don't expect folks to get it perfect, but it's about going through and, and thinking about those 50 tactics and having a conversation those tactics are incredibly vaguely worded. And I know this will resonate because folks were asking me for tips all the time. It's almost intentionally so. Uh, we, we can only overload you so much with information, but to have all of these tactics out there, it really requires the three or four of you to, to come to some common agreement around a particular tactic. And through that process, you're also sharing your own experiences. So you create a shared understanding, a common language for, for looking at, in this particular case, at CSR. You can go through each of these tactics and click on a tactic and it will give you some feedback. For example, on the board appointments, the coach feedback here says this tactic is bad for a variety of reasons. First of all, it encourages singularity of thought on the board. And second, whether or not true, it will create a perception that the CEO is trying to shore up her power. So a little bit of rationale. This rationale sits in behind each of these decisions. So for your particular team, you'll notice a post-it note that has the username and password for that team. So you can check it out over the next week to see how that team is doing and, and, and the decisions that you made. We look at sequencing. So some tactics need to be prefaced with other tactics to be, to be powerful. And a series of tactics here. This team did very well. 
And finally, we look at execution. So those tactics in which we had to select, for example, stakeholder analysis. We had to select how we're going to do it, how we're going to execute that particular tactic. And again, we're looking at, at the author's classification relative to what you thought these folks, how, they, how they, they, they aligned along skeptic, observer, advocate, this particular spectrum. Okay, so there's a lot of, of, of meat in here around the theory piece and, and giving some rationale behind each of the, the various different decisions. And we'll spend a little bit of time today. We've got a, a bit of time this morning. I know there are lots of questions, and uh, we'll field all those questions uh, just uh, probably in another 15 minutes or so with respect to specific tactics themselves. Okay. And then finally, we have our high scores list. And this is a... It's always fun. Some organizations play it up. Some folks play it down. But it's always fun. It kind of creates a, an additional level of, of emotional engagement in the competition. We've got our world record holders. And then the top 10 in this room. Team 22, congratulations. Fantastic job. Very good. And you'll notice a variety of other scores that are excellent, excellent. And the score here is is looking at those five dimensions and how well you, you address the needs of the CSR strategy as relates to those five dimensions and how efficiently you did it as well. Now you'll notice a lot of names up here in our world record holder list. And behind, beside the name is the number of times it took them to play it. So clearly you see that folks like Bart and Andy and Gus uh, played the simulation a few times. Uh, in other of our simulations, we find it fascinating, regardless of the fact that most of the people who, who play these simulations are in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. People play it again and again, and it's, the, it's a game. And when you, when you present people with a game and a challenge, it just really immerses them. And the fact that people learn something out of it, too, is, is incredible. Now, a lot of the names here you'll recognize are, are Dutch. And this particular simulation, for whatever reason, um, has had huge, huge take up in the Netherlands. So we have a, a variety of uh, probably eight to ten different business schools as well as different organizations in the Netherlands, but also you know, certainly across uh, Canada and, and now into Australia, which is great. Okay. So that's the reflect piece of experience CSR, and again, giving you a bit more, deep, bit more of, uh, background information, depth around the specific decisions. As you, um, before you log out of your computers here today, again, take a look around. If you have any questions about specific decisions, you can find probably most of those answers within the reflect piece. If I could just flip to the presentation for a moment. Great. So as you noticed, this type of simulation, it's just not about knowing. It's also about doing. And to do, it requires you to work in a team. And typically, we create teams of, of four to six, which, again, extends the decision-making process. I think for the time frames that we had here, teams of three were, were perfect. Uh, you work extremely well throughout the process. But it is important to, to work well in a team, to do well in this simulation, to do well in all of these simulations. Typical errors on the content side uh, are, are classic errors in, in change management. So insufficient unfreezing. This is taking action too soon, a lack of motivation for CSR, and insufficient communication of CSR vision. It, it, going ahead and skipping through those phases of the motivate and communicate is, is a classic error uh, in, in, in any change intervention, and, and CSR being an example of that for this particular organization. Not creating that felt need for change, the, the urgency is, is classic. And using this as an example, this simulation and other uh, simulations of ours as experiments on the real world, it's fascinating to see MBA students, for example, they just drive into the, to the act phase. We just got to get stuff done. And I think it's largely because of a, a lack of experience. Other folks uh, on the executive side, the typical error will be to think that doing one or two tactics on the, the motivate communicate side is enough, when in fact you can't really do enough on the motivate and communicate side. So it's, there are a number of tactics in there. And the, the teams that accelerated to 60% very quickly were the ones that, that, that dealt with that motivate communicate phase very well. A few uh, inappropriate interventions here, uh, counterproductive tactics. Any ideas? Not that we saw any counterproductive tactics out there, but any ideas about some of those? The With CEO the statement. The CEO statement, yes. And, and why was that, do you think? The CEO statement to the media. In that 
Right, so it was fluff, it was public relations. Yeah. Can, can I ask anybody, under what circumstances is it appropriate for the CEO to make a public statement about corporate social responsibility? Okay, so CEO might be able to make a credible public statement to external stakeholders when you're well advanced, when you've been through that seven-step change model. Are there any circumstances under which it might be appropriate for the CEO to be making statements about corporate social responsibility? Perhaps if something goes wrong, they might need to rescue, but I'm wondering about the... They might need to think... You might need to think about the particular stakeholders for whom it is appropriate for the CEO to be making statements. Any thoughts about uh, under what circumstances it might be appropriate for the CEO to make a public statement? I, I shouldn't say I should say statement rather than public statement. Might be appropriate for the CEO to talk to. Well, maybe when it's established as a best case practice and the company is getting lots of recognition, it shows positively on the bottom line in the conventional sense. Then maybe the CEO can act like Ray Anderson has done and given speeches to summits like ours and write a book, mm. which is obviously the most obvious statement. Okay, so Ray Anderson is credible as a CEO talking about corporate social responsibility or sustainability because they're well advanced and they've really done something about it. But are there other stakeholder groups for whom it might be appropriate for the CEO to speak earlier on in the piece? Perhaps shareholders? Who else? Perhaps. They're still external usually. Uh, employees, employees, you, part of your motivating and communicating and developing the vision and sharing the vision, CEOs w will and should be talking to employees early on in the process. But the particular tactic that we've had here is for external audiences, to talk to external audiences very late in the piece. If the CEO is talking about it early in the piece, the primary audience for that is employees. Great. Any other questions on specific tactics themselves? Yes. I'd actually like to know how you choose champion. I'd like to know how you choose the champion, because we failed really badly. We've got rude messages written all over red <laughs> and, and we thought we employed we chose the person who could actually do the job. So I'd like to understand some of the rationale behind how the game deals with that. What we look at um, in, in choosing a champion are the criteria that uh, Leora talked about in the upfront presentation. So somebody who uh, can vision, somebody who can, who can motivate, has some of the leadership skills, also some of the management skills as well. And, uh, and the selection was based on that particular criteria. I think there are four or five different points that were brought up. Hmm. That, uh, yeah, the, having the right people in the right position. So you, the, the people who need to be the CEO champions need to have real power in the organisation or be given real power in the organisation. And uh, they need to be advocates as well, without running other agendas. But you had a number of choices in the game for who would be a good CSI champion. It was not at all a clear-cut decision. In reality, it's very rarely a clear-cut decision who should be your C CSI champion. If anyone have other thoughts they'd like to contribute on the CSI champion, Linda? Um, I actually, our game told us that it should have been the marketing manager and I couldn't disagree more. <laughs> um, and I think that, um, sorry, and I've been sitting here holding my tongue, um, which you all know is very difficult for me to do after yesterday. Um, I actually think that uh, the marketing manager um, and we saw lots of ads yesterday that were bought before us by other speakers who showed us credit cards being um, displayed as fashion um, from a company I used to work for and uh, a whole lot of things coming out of marketing that are, are just not the way this needs to be seen. And my experience is it has to be someone who has business credibility. And marketing has marketing credibility and yes they can mm -hmm give the vision and they can, um, you know, help to get messages across, but 
they, are, they do not have business credibility with employees inside the business from that point of view. And I'm just going to say one thing. I also think that I absolutely think that a CEO speaking externally about a company's commitment early on, about the commitment to CSR, is very, very important because employees know that if you've made the commitment externally, he's serious about it. Yeah. And as all human beings, what interests my boss fascinates me. <laughs> That's a great quote. I know that quote. Thanks for that, Linda. The, um, the choice of the marketing person as a CSI champion, depending on how you play the game, it's going to recommend different people to you. You happen to get the marketing person because of the way you played the game. But if you played the game differently, you might have got feedback that suggested somebody else should be the C CSI champion. So it doesn't always pop up as the marketing person who is the most appropriate person. Can I just ask, um, just on that point, who you would have chosen as the appropriate person? I guess in some instances, marketing is not just making things look pretty and, and selling the product. It's a key part of strategy and you know, developing um, communication programs and partnerships. So who, in your opinion, would have been the appropriate person? Um, I agree. <laughs> I think somebody who is an appropriate person is someone who actually has key deliverables in their key performance indicators, and a marketing person actually can't deliver sustainability for the company. So it has to be someone who is actually responsible for delivering sustainability within the company. And so it could come out of culture, it actually could come out of a business unit such as, um, you know, in a financial services company, the head of business banking. It could be your chief financial officer or your head risk manager. So I do think it is um, your champion to, has to have business credibility. And in, in this particular case, what, what we do in simulations like this is we typically present organizations as a, with, with personalities and a real mixed bag of nuts, as we would say in Canada. Um, you're stuck, well, you're stuck with, with some of the, the folks there, and you've got to choose from amongst a fairly limited profile of people um, who do you think the best individual would be, as opposed to necessarily uh, an optimal, optimal choice? So, it's it's all um, wonderful points, and, and and thank you very much. And and other feedback about this is fantastic, uh, because we are this is version 2.0 of this. Other simulations of ours are in version seven and eight, and they just get better from feedback. So we do appreciate that. Yes. Just on that last point uh, that, that Linda Rose, I think there's also that one of the points that probably runs under, and I just was listening to that interchange there, and I'm sorry I wasn't here for the full sort of game bit, uh, and I'm sort of talking, but it's that whole question about whether or not you conceptualise CSR as something which has an external face or something that has an internal face. And I think the problem with the marketing model, and I know it happens very often, is that people think CSR is about impressing the outside, not about working on the inside. Uh, and I mean, I've got a very deviant view on this because I would also and ask questions about why do you have corporate donations in there because I don't think they've got anything to do with CSR. Because corporate donations are cause-related marketing or they might be employee sort of training and benefit stuff, but they're not corporate social responsibility because corporate social mm -hmm. responsibility in my version should be about the core activities of the organisation. So if you're making global positioning statements, what the hell are you doing with Head Start? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I'd just like to know why you have put those things in there. Yeah. It's certainly one of, the, one of the pillars we were looking at. And, and one of the challenges... Why, why is it a pillar? Well, one of the community investment and community involvement. And one of the challenges for this particular organisation was that you had key stakeholders who had long-standing interests with various different groups that, that kind of had no real purpose with the overall organization. It was, it was a, a, a pet project of, of various different stakeholders. So it was incumbent upon, from a, a team point of view, to look through and, and select perhaps a, a better balance for this organization. And some of the tactics that were included there are not good things, certainly. But it's, again, building a strategy is, is looking to, to balance things out a little bit. Well, I mean, I would seriously challenge, and I'd be curious about the views in the room about whether or not 
corporate donations are CSR or whether they're an optional extra. And I know that that's not a popular view because there's yeah. an awful lot of agencies that want it to be CSR, but there's an awful lot of organisations that think it is CSR, not just part of CSR. One of the great things about the experience CSR simulation when we use it in teams is that there is often a lot of controversy around some of the tactics. Is the marketing person the best person to be the champion? Should donations be in the CSR strategy at all? Should we advertise our corporate social responsibility? Should the CEO make a pronouncement? And sometimes the game will direct you to choices that you disagree with. And the great thing about that is that it creates a point for conversation and discussion inside the organisation or inside the teams. And I think it's okay if you disagree with stuff in the game because it brings you to a point where you're reflecting and actively thinking and arguing and deepening your understanding and your grasp of corporate social responsibility. So I'm not fussed when people come up with objections as to why, why this is wrong or not good enough or should be different and I have my own uh, pet things about experience here though where I think it should be more like this or more like that. We haven't even started to talk about the values propositions underneath um, some of the, uh, the <laughs> tactics. But what it is really good for is for bringing all this out into the open and getting the conversation going around what is it that is good for our organisation, what is our organisation's corporate social responsibility and what is the best way for us to do it. And this gives us a chance to play, play it out and practice in a virtual space some choices that we might have uh, in, uh, in the real world. Do you want Could, to ca uh, carry think, on with yeah, that? Yeah, I'll just do a couple more slides yeah. here. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, back here. I just wanted to address what Eva was saying before about corporate donations. I don't know about you guys, but a lot of co um, corporates start that way. Like it's a starting point for their corporate social responsibility program. They've been for years scattergunning approach and giving monies to charities. By, taking, by using that and working with that to create bigger change, but it's like a pillar of, big, of start where they think, well, we're making a difference rather than like an end result. So I think it still has credibility for getting CSR programs started within a workplace. Yeah, just as a different point of view of where it was coming from. Yeah, but I think that that also creates some of the problems because I think actually giving donations within a scattered gun approach is like being the community sector. Rather than implementing it within your staff, rather than implementing it with volunteer strategies. Exactly. I mean, community sector organisations have enormous trouble Oh, well, I, I yeah, understand that. But also, there, but there are volunteer opportunities that are value-adds. And as, as a CSR person, you've got to be able to recognise what a value-add volunteering opportunity is as opposed well, to thought, creating more work for the actual not-for-profit organisation. I still think it's staff development. It's got nothing to do with philanthropy. OK. Yes, my name is Annick Feth. I come from Norway. Uh, I have a comment, I'm missing a focus on the responsibility connected to the products the uh, company is producing and sending out on the market. Sorry, uh, I, I missed that. It, the product. The, the, the issue about whether the product is socially responsible. Oh, okay. And this, yes, and in this particular context for SkyTech, and, and I will pull this, push this back out, um, but uh, their challenge is that they create global positioning systems that have a marketplace in, in a commercial application. And of course, almost all of us, well, not all of us, but certainly we can all walk out and for 60 or $70 buy a, a global positioning system uh, to, to get our way around if we're going out into the woods. Um, am I understanding correctly? No, it's more about the concern about what kind of materials are I putting into the products and oh, I see. into the market. Yeah. And a responsibility in the future. What this, how are they going to treat the end of life of the products, for example? Responsibility connected to that. Right, right. And that, that, that particular issue isn't really covered in the simulation. You're right. You're right. And perhaps we could do that in the future. Yeah. No, it's a good point. Yeah, thank you. Did you have a question? Just a mic down here, please. Yeah, great, thanks. We 
relatively, well, about halfway through, we got rid of the offshore um, manager who ran the offshore <coughs> factory because under our code of ethics, it was very important that um, there were certain human rights and we felt through the some of the stuff we read and, and some of the interviews that that wasn't being met by the offshore um, operations and we felt that was a real risk. And, you know, Red, Red Star's all up because it was culturally inappropriate to put a North American manager into the offshore operations. So I just um, just wanted to sort of, sort of challenge that and, um, and if it was done appropriately, then it really would, would actually be the organisation living out its ethics um, proactively rather than just saying we don't really care what happens offshore, let's pretend. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it is assuming, though, that, that we can't find somebody who is, whoops, within within that offshore nation, who can, who can do this? Um, I wonder, Leora, if you have a yeah, thought on that? Look, there's not much more that I can add, add to that. I mean, the, the game does say that it's an inappropriate tactic, and it often is an inappropriate, it's culturally inappropriate to, uh, to override the, the local people. But whether, whether it's always the wrong tactic in every situation, I really couldn't say. That would be up to you to decide. And again, one of the strengths of this uh, simulation, the strengths of this game, is that it does get people talking about the pros and cons of different kinds of tactics. So I mean, just because the game says it was wrong for you to get rid of the offshore manager in that situation, I wouldn't necessarily say, well, it's always going to be wrong, but I certainly would say that that's a signal to you to think extremely carefully about what you're doing if you do have the opportunity to implement a tactic like that, because there are cultural sensitivity issues and issues for employee buy-in in the areas where those managers are that you should... Re it's raising a red flag for you, basically, to say, tread carefully here. This is something where it's not a, going to be a clear-cut decision. Louise Hicks, Phillips Fox in Melbourne. We got a red flag for uh, trying to get our business case done early. It may be a product yes, of yeah. being a bunch of consultants over here, lawyers, accountants, and buying <laughs> um, So we do accept that. Um, but we were trying to get our business case in very, very front end because what we found in our shared experience is that to get the board on board, you've got to do that risk analysis yeah. and say this is important because uh, we were encouraged by the game, no, get your strategy in place and then do the business uh, case. But it did engender a really good conversation about, well, actually, in, in our experience, business case comes right up front. Yeah. And that's a big piece of feedback that I certainly heard from a number of different teams was that, that, pers that perspective and the importance of doing that. So we'll certainly revisit that and look at that. Question, just so that okay. we can chat to Leora finish. And of course, you are available for lunch. Yes. And I'm sure you will get the button bolt yeah. Okay, great. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. I want to leave a little time for Leora. Uh, typical errors on the process side in a simulation like this, where we put you in a, in a really aggressive time frame, um, what we find is on a behavioral side of things, we often fall into our, our common patterns of decision making and get quite reactive when things don't play out the way we expect them to. And we see two types of behavior there. One is panic shopping, where people will look towards the cheapest tactics, which are often the worst tactics. And the other one is dartboard selecting. So looking through that, those tactics that you, you threw out earlier on and just pulling them out and saying, you know, I haven't done anything from, you know, from this particular group. So it, it's interesting to see just from a human behavior point of view and from a, a decision-making point of view, how natural it is for us to fall back into these reactive modes uh, in the absence or, or with, with a lot of time pressure, et cetera. And that's, that's part of what, what our job is, is to create those real world pressures. Key success factors, again, on the content side, preparing the organization sufficiently for, for change, using an integrative approach for SkyTech, looking at the five pillars of CSR here, ethics, employee relations, human rights, community investment, and environment. And these are a series of tactics uh, within each. And, and I think in each of your debriefs, as you went into the reflect modules, you saw this. And then on the process side, this was great. This was really well done. Uh, effective teamwork, listening. One of the things that I do look for when I, when I watch groups is for individuals to disconnect. And you can just read their body language really quickly. They, they start by 
by being hunched over the computer, hunched over the desk, then they move back, then eventually they're pushing their chair back. And it's a really good thing to, to note from a, from a facilitator's point of view, but also from a teamwork point of view. And, and in meetings now, when I see my people not listening to me, I, tr I just read their body language that way. And it's just a fascinating uh, an insight I see from these types of simulations, how, how natural that process can take place and can happen. So from being fully engaged to disengagement, it's, it's not a very, uh, a very long process. It doesn't take a lot of time. But it was wonderful to see everybody really engaged today, and that was fantastic.